next session at CPDP. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your coffee. This session is going to look at automatic face recognition in the UK. We have an excellent set of panelists um, offering up a number of different perspectives on recent developments around face recognition in the UK. My name is Professor William Webster. I'm the moderator for this session. I'm the director of a research centre called CRISP. CRISP is an alliance of four universities in the UK, University of Edinburgh, University of Stirling, University of St Andrews and University of Essex. Um, we work together to do research around all sorts of issues to do with surveillance and privacy in the digital age. We are the host of this session and um, we have organised this, this brilliant lineup of speakers. Now, I'm not going to introduce all the speakers one by one because we have five speakers and we have a limited amount of time. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. You will have seen their names rotating on the backdrop behind me as, as you're all taking your seats. What I'm going to do is jump straight into our first speaker. So I'm going to hand over immediately to Tony Porter, the UK Surveillance Camera Commissioner. Thank you. OK, hi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delighted to be here and delighted to lead the vanguard of these excellent speakers. Um, as Williams just said, I'm the Surveillance Camera Commissioner. And uh, part of my role is actually regulation of live facial recognition in the UK, together with other regulators, the uh, uh, Invested Powers Commissioner, the Information Commissioner, the Forensic Regulator, the Biometric Commissioner. So if you think and hope that you will walk out of this session with a great deal of clarity, I'm not entirely convinced that's going to be the case. But I do commit I will be prom uh, open, honest and transparent with you about the difficulties we're facing. I think I'm going to kick off by saying let's not forget AI, facial recognition, is fairly new beer. I was listening to a woman called Baroness Onora O'Neill talking about the introduction of the printing press in 1450. It wasn't for 150 years that legislation came on the back, such as defamation, such as copyright, that actually started to control that. The difference, of course, with facial recognition is that its real impact is here and now amongst millions. And perhaps that's just indicative of the modern world we live in, where our threats to privacy are immediate, instantaneous, and massive. Very quickly, my role, uh, I oversee a code of practice. It was introduced by statute, Protection of Freedoms Act. I oversee a national surveillance camera strategy, of which William Webster is the citizens' engagement lead. Um, and I also issue guidance to the police on the use of live facial recognition. That is on my website, and uh, it has recently been taken into account by a court of law. More of that in a minute. Also, my background, and I think in terms of transparency, I need to tell you that uh, in a former life, I was head of counterterrorism in the UK and led the uh, counterterrorism operation in the Olympic Games. And a newspaper in the UK said, when referencing my take in this role, isn't that a little bit like putting Dracula in charge of a blood bank? And I thought, well, actually, it's a fair, a fair issue. And, and my role really has been fairly... Uh, determined to ensure that I come to this gig with an honest, open pair of hands. And after the six years I've been in post, I'm pretty sure that I'll be able to evidence that by the criticism and critique I've levelled at the police, but also the support I think I've given to the police, law enforcement, local authorities and the general public in terms of how they use surveillance. So I'm only up here for 10 minutes. It's a little bit like speed dating, and I really want you to like me by the time I move over there and hand over to somebody else. But what I'm going to do is just frame a brief history uh, of my life in the last year that I think will encapsulate what's happening with live facial recognition in the UK. Two days ago, I was sat at the Home Office with the Minister of the Crown for Police, the Biometric Commissioner, the Forensic Regulator, and government officials discussing how we were going to deliver on Boris Johnson's commitment to introduce legislation in his manifesto that provides governance for artificial in, uh, intelligence and biometric capabilities. So there's a commitment there in the UK to legislate new statute and be absolutely clear that the government is determined to bring that in. What it looks like, I think, 
will be down to my colleagues, people we work with, to help and support the government to develop that. Three days ago, I read that the EU was looking at putting a moratorium on live facial recognition. Now, that's very interesting. The day before that, I was asked by Radio 4 on a programme that's going to be released next week. Is that something I support? Now, let me jump off the fence and be very clear. I think live facial recognition will be used by the police, ought to be used by the police, can provide benefits to the police, undoubtedly. But it's in its current format, with the governance that uh, overlooks it, with the regulations, with the backdrop. In answering that question, I said, yes, I do think it's a good idea to have a temporary moratorium because I think the legislation and the regulation needs to be clearer and more transparent. Just a little before that Radio 4 interview, over, I'd say, the last six, nine months, we've seen across the world the whole issue of facial recognition clamour for media attention. We've seen the Americans in San Francisco, Oakline, uh, Minnesota, all moving away from the use of facial recognition. I have a concern about this, and the concern is I think they're asking the wrong question. For me, the question should be, uh, what is it about facial recognition that's causing the issue? Is it the data invasion? Is it the surveillance? Is it the data transfer? And I still think we're in the foothills of a new conversation, hence Baroness O'Neill talking about the printing press. Last year, I attended the High Court and I intervened in what I understand was the first global High Court equivalent case around the use of facial recognition. Bridges v South Wales Police, working with Liberty, advancing the argument. Now, Liberty and Bridges on that occasion did not win and it's going to the Court of Appeal. I intervened in that court case and my argument was that in the current climate, it's lawful. It's lawful because the police were complying with the Data Protection Act. They were complying with the Protection of Freedoms Act, which is what I oversee. They were demonstrating compliance with common law, and they were supporting all of that with a whole range of policy documents that ensured, in their view, it was lawful. Now, the court concurred. They agreed that in that circumstance it was lawful. But you must read the lines in that judgment. In that circumstance, they recognised the fluidity of the common law. There was a nod, I would say, in the direction of the fact that it might not be sufficient in all circumstances. And I think the caveats attached around that actually are a pretty good indicator of what's going to happen at the Court of Appeal. The debate is going to advance, and I think uh, the decision may come under some pressure. But that's where we are in the UK. Am I a fan of live facial recognition? Only if used in certain circumstances. My concerns are that the legislation isn't transparent enough and that the police don't know what they should or shouldn't do. Now, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only regulator in the UK that's intervened on five occasions to stop the use of live facial recognition. So whilst I've said it's lawful in Bridges v South Wales, I have caused the cessation. Why? Because in my view, the proposals weren't necessary, they weren't proportionate, there was no command and control, there was no oversight, there was no legal advice, there was no guidance. It was wrong. And I wouldn't say the police were bad. The police were trying to catch bad people, but their infrastructure around it wasn't good and there was no senior top cover. So all those protective things that society demand weren't in place, largely born out of organisational incompetence at that level. It's no excuse, and I've been very firm with chief constables, and I think the judgment in Bridges has also uh, provided clarity and direction. So, I think I've got a few minutes left uh, too. In the conversation with the Minister, we talked about the availability of DPA and GDPR. Is it sufficient? Well, the UK is introducing new legislation. It suggests not. Common law is too fluid. State surveillance is increasingly intrusive. It provides a threat to security and privacy. It must be clear and transparent. I would argue that it is currently not.
The government's conundrum, in my view, relating to AI is do they separate between commercial and law enforcement and what happens when law enforcement work with commercial? I think it's a real problem and it needs to be delineated. Finally, I have asked for two things from the government. I have called publicly for two things. The first, I believe in the UK that we need a, a fundamental review of overt surveillance akin to that provided by Lord David Anderson in his seminal document entitled A Question of Trust, which looks at covert surveillance. There are parallels in terms of structure, oversight, authorization and common law necessity and proportionality that the police law enforcement must use if they're going to use this technology. And secondly, I believe that we should be mirroring in some regards the Investigative Powers Commission's office where there is judicial oversight, not necessarily for every level, but there needs to be an authorization scope. I believe the government has good intent. I believe the UK government wants to maximize the money that can be made out of AI, but it will not do so unless it sets a framework and a legislative framework that allows it to be done when the confidence of the public is met. Thanks very much. That's all I've got to say. And uh, let's see what happens next. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you found today as informative as I have. Um, lots of really good discuss discussions going on today. So my name is Stephen Wright. I am one of a handful of principal policy advisors at the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, my current focus is on police, justice, and surveillance uh, within our high-profile investigations department. Now, for those of you that may not have heard of the ICO before, or our Elizabeth Denham, our Information Commissioner, we are the UK's independent authority, set up to uphold information rights in the public interest, promoting openness by public bodies, and data privacy for individuals. So mindful in the time that I do have, uh, I want to give you a quick overview of the use and regulation of automatic facial recognition in the UK from a data protection perspective. Now as this technology processes the personal, biometric data of identifiable individuals, data protection law will apply. So I'm going to give a current perspective of the UK's data protection regulatory authority. So I suppose a key question is, is AFR being used in the UK? Well, yes, it definitely is being used. But at the moment, there perhaps a large amount of organizations are still curious. They're testing or they're piloting the potential capabilities of the technology as opposed to using it routinely. Now, with that said, the ICO has a keen interest in those who seek to use the technology as normal course of business. But we also have to be very reactive and keep our eyes and ears open for new and novel uses of the technology and related stories that pop up in the media. And a few examples are on the slide here, ranging from law enforcement, the use in shopping centers, football stadiums, and believe it or not, even bars, pubs, and clubs. So it's important to note that the use of AFR is split between both public and private sectors in the UK. We have certainly seen the police and law enforcement agencies extensively test the capabilities of AFR in public spaces on large numbers of the general public to help assist the prevention and detection of crime. We've also seen the technology used retrospectively to identify individuals from historic footage as opposed to locating them in real time. Not without its controversies, however. As I am sure you'll be aware that the legal challenges have, that have arisen because of the use of AFR in the UK, raising key questions about the police's use of AFR, challenging the lawful basis, the governance around personal information that's collected in real time, and interaction with the rights and freedoms that individuals have. And I'm sure Hannah's going to talk a little bit more about this later on. So there should be a balance struck between the privacy that people rightly expect when going about their daily lives and the surveillance technology that the police need to effectively use to carry out their role. Therefore, police forces must provide sound evidence to show that AFR, AFR technology is strictly necessary. It's balanced and effective in each specific context in which it's deployed. <clears throat> 
So in terms of the private sector, we are aware that such technologies you know, can be an attractive solution to some problems. It could assist queuing times, for example. It could streamline authentication or authorization or grant access into secure premises. But regardless of its use, it still has to be proven to be lawful, necessary, justified, and proportionate. Now, I know Eduardo is going to talk a little bit more about the legal side of things, but focusing on the UK's data protection law, it's important to understand that the legislative framework that is in place for the processing of biometric data via AFR and personal data more generally as well. Now, I'm sure that you're no strangers to GDPR, but in the UK there is also an accompanying Data Protection Act 2018. It sits alongside the GDPR and tailors how it applies in the UK for example, by providing exemptions. It also sets out the Information Commissioner's functions and powers. More specifically, there's a dedicated part of the DPA 2018 for criminal law enforcement, which transposes the EU law enforcement directive, if you're aware of that. So our recent work, which I will go on to talk about, has focused on compliance for this particular part for UK law enforcement agencies in the UK. But as always, it's important that data protection is not perceived as a barrier, which it often is. There are provisions in the law that allow processing to take place and data sharing, providing, again, that it is justified and appropriate and adheres to the boundaries of the law, and organisations are more importantly held accountable for their decision making. In addition, good information governance shouldn't be seen as a limit to innovation, but also it should be there to assist it as well. So I guess you're thinking, OK, well, what does the ICO expect from organisations who wish to use this technology? Well, as with the processing of any personal data, or biometric data for that matter, there has to be a clear lawful basis to demonstrate the processing that is fair, lawful, and transparent where appropriate. We expect there to be a rigorous data protection impact assessment in place con conducted prior to any of the processing outlining how the processing ad adheres to the principles of data protection law and how data protection by design approach has also been implemented. And this therefore sits alongside other policy documents as well that the legislation asks for. So where organisations fall foul of the law, <coughs> and they do, the Information Commissioner has a range of enforcement and sanctioning powers, from light to the more severe. So this could range from letters warning against intended processing of data, to monetary penalties of up to 4% of the global turnover for the most serious and harmful contraventions. Ouch. So the next question is, well, what have the ICO been up to? Well, we've certainly been very busy, and I can attest to that, in terms of researching and investigating the use of AFR in the UK, but particularly in the law enforcement sector. Now, on the 31st of October last year, we published our findings in relation to how the police use facial recognition technology in public spaces. So please do give this a read if you haven't already. And it's available from our website, ico.org.uk. At the same time, quite uniquely, the Information Commissioner blogged and published her first ever opinion uh, under the DPA 2018, again exploring the application of data protection law for law enforcement purposes. So it's the Commissioner's view that the current combination of laws, codes, general practices relating to AFR in the UK will not actually drive the ethical and legal approach that's needed to truly manage the risk that this technology presents. So see some uh, key points uh, of, the, of the opinion and outline, sensitive processing occurs irrespective of whether the image yields a match to a person on the watch list or those that are not on watch lists. Data protection law applies to the whole process of the use of AFR, from consideration about necessity and proportionality, to the compilation of watch lists, to the actual processing of the biometric data, all the way to the retention and the deletion of this data. So controllers must all also identify a lawful basis for the use of AFR. This should be identified and appropriately applied in conjunction with other available le legislative um, instruments, such as codes of practice, like Tony mentioned before. And the Commissioner does actually intend to work with other relevant authorities and supervisory authorities with a view to strengthen the legal framework by means of statutory, perhaps, or binding code of practice issued by the government. <clears throat> 
So I did mention some resources on our website, and just to kind of close, um, as always, the ICO has a vast array of resources on their web pages to assist organizations processing personal data in a compliant way. We are also working to update our existing um, guidance on video surveillance technologies, including AFR, but also body-worn video, automatic number plate recognition, and drones, just to name a few. So please also visit our AI auditing framework pages, where we have published our thoughts on a range of technology and innovation topics, featuring blogs from a colleague of mine, Ruben Bins, who is actually speaking right now, but in another room, and he's going to be here for the next few days as well. Um, and I think it's important to say that there are other resources that do come out quite regularly. And only today, we have our age-appropriate design code as well, which has been published for those that have seen it. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you found that useful. And I'll pass on to the next person. OK. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Hannah, and I'm here from Liberty, a UK-based human rights and civil liberties organization. We challenge injustice, defend freedom, and campaign for fairness across the UK. I sit in our policy and campaigns team, so I work on all things relating to tech and human rights, which is an enormous brief, as you can imagine. And that also means that I lead our work on facial recognition and our campaign to ban facial recognition. There's two green buttons, I would like everyone to know. So, you've probably heard a great deal here about facial recognition today. Some of you will already have your own expertise and experiences with it. You'll know how it works, and we've already heard today how it's being used in the UK. What I'd like to do is something a little different and think about the sorts of questions Liberty thinks we should be asking. We should encourage, I think, all of us to think how this impacts on our daily lives, to tell a story about what a future with facial recognition in it looks like. And whilst I'll be absolutely thinking of the framework of rights, that's my role here, also again encouraging you to think what this looks like for you and your lives. But also in doing that, to recognize the role that privilege plays when we think about how we respond to facial recognition. How there are communities in the UK, and I'm sure elsewhere, who are at the very sharp end of over-policing, over-surveillance and rights abuses. For example, people of colour, people of faith, those with uncertain immigration status and those on low incomes. So I think we are asking the wrong questions around this technology. We're talking about how we regulate it, how we apply ethics to it, how we do all of this once we're already using it. I think we need different questions. We need to ask questions around human rights, how this corrodes those human rights, and whether that means we should be using it at all. And I wish that question had been asked before it was used in the first place. So I have five questions I'd like us all to ponder today, and perhaps we can discuss those further together during questions at the end. So, Question one for me is really, what is privacy and why does it matter? Privacy will mean different things to different people. I think that's important. For me, what it means is flourishing and freedom. And that's an intrinsic part of the people who designed these rights. That's what they were getting at. Our ability to show different sides of ourselves in different settings, to decide who we want to be and what we share with others. I think that privacy ultimately is what allows us to be who we are. And I think that it's really important to remember that privacy isn't simply a tick box on a user agreement. It's not a name for incognito browsing. It's a living and breathing thing, and it is put under threat by these kinds of technologies. So why do I say that that comes into play here? Well, first of all, we see here a technology which snatches our deeply sensitive biometric data. It's unique to each one of us. We can't change it if it falls into the wrong hands or if it falls into the hands that we don't want it to be in. And with live facial recognition, we see thousands of people having their data taken in this way. It's happening without their consent. 
but it's also happening without their knowledge. Most people we speak to at deployments of facial recognition have no idea what's just happened to them. And of course, far from just being scanned while you're going about your everyday life, you might also be on a police watch list. We don't know. There's no guidance around that. What we do know is that South Wales police, who are really leading the charge in its use in the UK, have accepted that, yes, anyone could be on a watch list. You don't have to be wanted for any kind of wrongdoing. You could be of intelligence interest, and we all know how broadly that can be interpreted when it suits the state. I also think this feeds in to an enormous picture that I'm sure we're all exploring across these few days, which is around big data and the role that plays in our society, something else to be mindful of when we think about the damages this sort of tech can cause. So my next question for you, how do the rights risks go beyond privacy? Why is it not just about privacy? Well, that's because privacy is interwoven with your freedom of expression and your right to assemble as well, so essentially to protest. What I think happens here is that even the possibility that we are under this kind of surveillance changes the way that we behave. It changes where we go, who we go with, what activities we feel we can participate in whether that's going to worship at a particular place of worship, whether that's going to a political meeting, whether that's going to a protest. And some of you will know that Liberty have been working with Ed Bridges in the UK to bring the first ever challenge to facial recognition. And he was targeted by this technology at a protest, the very place where people should feel safe to express their dissent and like they're not under intrusive observation from the state. We shouldn't have to change the way that we live our daily lives to avoid this kind of unwarranted surveillance. The London Policing Ethics Panel did some research on this and found that nearly 40% of people aged 16 to 24 simply would not go to an event where facial recognition was in use. This, for me, is extraordinarily telling. And we don't see engagement with that problem when we talk about this use of technology. When we talk about legalizing it or regulating it, we don't talk about how we make that different and how we recognize that for those people, these threats are real. And it's not necessarily about any form of wrongdoing. It's about wanting the right to move around public spaces without having to always give up your anonymity. There's also the issue of freedom from discrimination. And one question that isn't asked a great deal in these conversations is how can this kind of technology still be discriminatory even if we make it perfect? Now, we all know that facial recognition is far from perfect as of yet, but I absolutely accept that it's going to improve. The reason is because that this kind of technology is used in a context of over-policing and over-surveillance of people of colour. We see that, for example, with the way that police stop and search black people nine times more than they would the white equivalent. We've also seen facial recognition in the UK deployed for two years running at Notting Hill Carnival, a celebration of black Caribbean culture, and two times running in the London Borough of Newham, so one of the most diverse areas of London. Yes, it's absolutely right that this technology is actually most likely to misidentify people of colour, so subject them to a false stop, which could be anything from something that makes them legitimately extremely angry to something that is terribly frightening. But it's not just people of colour that are at risk of misidentification, all of us are to some extent, but particularly women, young people, people who are trans. So yes, they're more likely at this stage to be subject to a false stop, and that is enormously problematic in and of itself. But I don't think this is about making this tool better. I don't want to see a more effective tool doing this kind of mass surveillance. We shouldn't seek to perfect these instruments of mass surveillance by essentially over-surveilling the groups that we already accept we're over-surveilling. I'm really fearful of what a perfect facial recognition tool might do to our society and to our democracy. My next question, question three. How does facial recognition fit in a wider web of surveillance? Well, the answer, if you're part of the state or if you are in a private company that builds your money on this, is very nicely, thank you. Um, I made this slide myself. You can see that this all fits together in an enormous web of surveillance that allows each and every one of us to be vulnerable to be monitored at any given time. <laughs> 
IMSI captures, cell phone extraction, body-worn video, social media intelligence, increasing data collection, increasing data sharing. This all creates a pernicious and unacceptable web of surveillance. Whether it's driven by the state, whether it's driven by private companies, whether most dangerously it's a combination of both, we're losing our ability to exist anonymously in public spaces. So that brings me on to my fourth question. What are the problems with that overlap between the state and private companies? In the UK, one example is its use outside King's Cross Station, so a massive train station in the centre of the capital of London. There it was revealed that a private company had been deploying facial recognition. And initially, the police denied all knowledge, but later admitted that they got that wrong. And yes, they had actually shared deeply sensitive data with that private company to allow them to carry out this operation. That, for us, is unacceptable. It doesn't allow for proper transparency. We don't know that our data is being properly handled in those circumstances. And we shouldn't be supportive of this kind of data sharing. Looking at that problem more widely, the idea that increasingly private companies are building a business on surveillance. Look to Amazon, for example, selling tools to the state that allow for more surveillance and essentially really eroding that barrier that used to exist between the state and private company interests. It also reduces transparency because we can't get all the information about how these tools work from private companies that don't want to reveal what they consider to be their trade secrets. So my final question, question five. If we consider all of this, if we think about it carefully, what should we do with facial recognition? For us, the answer is that we should ban it. Even if we do address these human-in-the-loop models, even if we encourage transparency, if we regulate it, if we introduce a law, it's not going to address the kinds of rights risk we're talking about here. It will always be disproportionate. It will always threaten our ability to live freely, and it will always be used in a discriminatory way. I would really caution us against this idea of tech inevitability that is driven by the interests of the state and the interests of private companies. It's not in the interests of ordinary people. It's dressed up as convenience. It's dressed up as something that is actually improving our safety. But surveillance tools that threaten our rights are making us less safe, not more safe. Look to San Francisco, the very birthplace of this kind of technology. They banned it. Other US cities are following suit. Look at the calls we've already heard from the EU for there to at least be a moratorium. We would say any moratorium that sensibly considers the evidence here will result in a permanent ban. ban sorry. We shouldn't be looking to support this kind of tool, which is about oppression and about control. I don't think it has any place in our schools, in our train stations, in our football stadiums, in our shopping centers. I don't think it has any place on our streets. Thank you. Well, those were some compelling, strong arguments on some fundamental questions for, for the way in which we go and, and try to live our lives. So I'm going to bring this down a, a level in terms of, uh, I think, I'm going to pose a much more mundane question, perhaps, but important. Important in the context of the debate we are having as to whether this type of facial re recognition technology should be banned or should be restricted in some way or should be regulated in, in any special way. And the question I'm, I'm posing is, how does the current framework affect this type of technology of facial recognition? Or to put it in an even more mundane way, how the GDPR and the sister enforcement uh, legislation, law enforcement data protection legislation, deal with this issue on how they regulate the use of automatic or auto automatic facial recognition. And we need to start from the very basics. And you may say, well, of course we know this. Of course we know that capturing images of people scanning faces in a football stadium, in a crowd, involves processing of personal data. But you would be surprised how many people who are involved in those type of activities would say, well, but we're not really trying to identify anybody. We're only trying to make a, a small match. And we really need to start from the very beginning to explain and to understand that, yes, 
even the activity of scanning faces in a football stadium involves the processing of personal data. And of course, this audience also knows that the nature of that personal data and the purpose for which it is being used and is being processed qualifies as a special category of data, which is subject to its own regime. Because, of course, it's biometric data that is used for the, for the purpose of uniquely identifying an individual. And that has a number of consequences. First of all, we also know, because we know the law, that in order to even justify this type of processing, we need to find a lawful ground. And, and this is a basic aspect of the law. And, as I'm saying, because it is biometric data that is used for the purposes of uniquely identifying an individual, not only we need to find a lawful grounds to justify this, we need to make sure that it is not prohibited. The, the use of this information, the use of this personal data, is already prohibited by the law. It's already, by default, banned. Article 9 of the GDPR prohibits the processing of this type of personal data, unless, of course, there is an exemption from that prohibition. So just at the very base, basic level of the legal framework, we need to address these this fundamental issues. Finding a lawful ground is not easy. It's not easy in, a, in the context of technology that we know you cannot rely on consent, consent, as debated as it is. It's an easy one to rule out here because, of course, nobody, you cannot go and ask 100,000 people in a football stadium if they consent to the biometric data being captured. Of course, it's not part of the contractual relationship of inviting these 100,000 people to, to watch a football match. So some of the most solid grounds, if you want, for the use of personal data are already out, out of the question. So we're left with what we are always left with, a good old legitimate interest ground. But of course, we also know that relying on legitimate interest is not the kind of thing that said, ah, it's just it's useful. It's just, it's just it's good. It's good and don't worry about it. We'll, we'll be fine. It's a complex lawful ground to rely on because it does require a very detailed assessment of the significance of that type of processing of data. If we think that's difficult, think about the fact that legitimate interest does not even exist in the context of law enforcement, or at least it doesn't exist even in the context of public authorities, which means that you're left with an even narrower ground for processing. The idea that you need to ensure that it is absolutely necessary for the performance of a task which has to be in the public interest. How do we justify that? How do we justify that legitimate interest or how do we justify that public, public interest? In practice, this all comes down to the same mechanism. We need to ensure that we understand that developing, using, implementing, doing anything to do with facial recognition is going to require, by law, a very detailed data protection impact assessment. It's in the law. It's not even something that just the Information Commission Office is recommending as good practice. It's a requirement in the data protection framework. It's a requirement that only takes one article of the 99 of the GDPR. So you would say, how difficult can it be? It's just one article. But it's a requirement that looks at some of the most, fundament most fundamental aspects that data protection law is all about. It looks at some of the issues that Hannah was talking about, transparency. It looks at issues like is this really the data that is needed for? Do we really, really need to collect this data? Is there a justification for it? In the whole scheme of things, taking everything into account, taking all possible measures, do we really need this?
Does it even work? Is it really accurate? And how, for how long is this going to be floating around? How do we ensure that this is not turned into a database of faces? All of these considerations need to be looked at very, very, very carefully. And again, this is not just best practice. This is a requirement under the law. And it's a requirement under the law that it's not just a matter of ticking boxes on a form or any kind of thing that you can almost outsource to artificial intelligence. There needs to be real thought, a thought process involving the DPO, the person, the people who have responsibility for reviewing this thing, for undertaking a, a true assessment of the previous implications of this type of processing. And I would be very surprised if there was any kind of application of facial recognition that wouldn't trigger the next article in the GDPR that requires not only a data protection impact assessment, but consultation with the regulator. So that's already there. That's already the regulation that exists. And that's even before we get to the next level of a special category of data. Because then, as, as I said, the law already prohibits this type of processing. Unless, of course, you have an exemption in place. An exemption that, when you look at the possible exemptions under the law, there are many that would be relevant. In fact, there's only probably just one that you can rely on. And if, you think, if we think that legitimate interest is difficult and public interest is difficult, substantial public interest needs to reach a new level. A new level that the law itself, in the, it, again, this is not just good practice. This is in the text of the law that requires that this assessment, and in order to apply this type of exemption, the law has to be there and it has to be proportionate already to the aims. And that practice or that activity has to respect the essence of data protection rights and data protection law. The essence of data protection is something that the European Court of Justice is looking at. This is not just baseline level compliance. This is some of the most sophisticated aspects and difficult and complex aspects of data protection law that the highest courts are looking at. So when you look at that and then you add the practicalities of the existing framework at a, at a member state level, in my case here in this panel in the UK, you also need to ensure that you meet the, the practical requirements that are there in the law. In the law, in, in the Data Protection Act, there is a specific requirement to ensure that if you are going to rely on this type of exemption, there has to be an appropriate policy document. It's a new creation of the new Data Protection Act. This is to say, in barely 10 minutes, that this is an area of practice or an activity that not only is already banned up to a level, but is strict, very strictly regulated. And if anyone is involved in, in developing, in using, in implementing this technology, it is absolutely crucial for the lawfulness of their activities to ensure that they follow this process. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, I'm David Reichel. I work for the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, the mandate of our agency is to provide the EU institutions and its member states 
uh, with data and analysis related to fundamental rights as enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So in this way, I will zoom out a bit compared to my previous speakers and give uh, a view of, at EU level and the way um, the discussions and developments in the United Kingdom also inform the development at the EU level from fundamental rights perspective. Um, so, um, I'm managing a, a research project that deals with fundamental rights implications of artificial intelligence. And the FRA has published a study that deals with the use of biometrics and use large-scale databases. And as a combination of these two research projects, uh, we decided to uh, publish a paper that deals with fundamental rights implications of facial recognition technology um, in order to inform the many ongoing uh, policy debates around this issue. In our paper, we focused on, on the use of the technology by public administration, we conducted a couple of interviews and we discussed a selected number of fundamental rights. And this paper is the basis uh, for my intervention. Um, it has been mentioned in several panels already. It's just always good to be reminded that there is not one uh, facial recognition technology, but that there are several purposes and ways in which it can be used. Um, the, the main difference being between verification one-to-one, -one, where you just verify that one person is the same that the people on two images are in fact the same persons which is used at automated border control gates or for unlocking your cell phones for identification also called one to many where one image is compared to several others and it's tried to be um, uh, I think, um, detected if this person is on the list um, of this watch list for example and live facial recognition technology as it's been discussed also in the UK is part of identification but it, it proceeds in two steps first from video material it needs to be detected how many faces is there a face on the video and then this face is taken and compared to a watch list and lastly it is also important it's used for categorization which means not identifying individuals but rather deducing characteristics of individuals um, from the face of people like for example gender identification ethnicity and age and there are several other adventurous research uh, on what can be seen from a face um, so Focusing on live facial recognition technology, we tried to get an overview of the use cases in several uh, EU member states. And here the United Kingdom obviously stands out because it's the only country uh, where the technology is used also using real watch lists. Um, but there were tests uh, and there are plans in many other EU member states as well. For example, in Germany, there was a large test at the train station, but this test involved volunteers, where volunteers could sign up, they delivered their images, and then um, other people were informed that this test is uh, going on here, and then it was tested uh, uh, how accurate the technology can identify uh, the volunteers on the train station. A similar test was done at the Carnival in France, in Nice, uh, where also volunteers signed up and uh, then it was checked how accurate the technology can detect people uh, passing by. But as I said, also other member states uh, bought software and have plans on using the software and are doing tests. Um, so from, from our uh, small research, one of the main findings in a way is a non-finding because there's no comprehensive overview on who is in fact using facial recognition technology and, and for what purposes. So even in the UK, but also in, in the tests in the other countries, it's not really clear who should be put on the watch lists. And if you don't know exactly or not clearly define who should be on watch lists, it is really difficult uh, to assess the purpose of the use of the technology. There are also plans at EU level, um, not live facial recognition, um, but to use uh, faces, uh, facial images in large-scale databases in the field of migration um, and security. And there's ongoing research on facial recognition technology. It's been mentioned before, the private sector is also an important user of the technology, but in our paper we did not uh, look into this. So what are the fundamental rights considerations? It's important to acknowledge the public perception of the technology from the outset. Um, it is, there's not much uh, information and only few data collections about how people feel about the use of the technology. 
And well, it's often reported that the majority of people, in fact, feel comfortable with the use of the technology. There is always a certain specific share in the population that feels extremely uncomfortable being subject to face recognition technology. There was one survey carried out in the United Kingdom, for example, where one in 10 of the respondents said, I feel really uncomfortable when the technology is used by the police. Um, if it's used by uh, private companies, people feel actually much more uncomfortable um, when it's used. So it needs to be acknowledged that there's always a certain share in the population that does not agree uh, with the use of this technology. And if it's then used, um, the, the treatment of these people needs to be taken into account. And this also impacts on the human dignity, which is in fact the foundation of fundamental rights. Um, as we know, some of the fundamental rights can be limited, and we had the discussion already, but there are clear criteria set out when fundamental rights, such as the right to uh, privacy and data protection, can be limited. As previous speakers have already also discussed, it comes to it must be based on law, it must be necessary and be proportionate. Um, so the way it interferes with fundamental rights, of course, depends on the purpose. For some reasons, it might be a completely different case as for other reasons, depending on who is uh, put on the watch list and also the place where it's being used. Um, lastly, a point uh, on accuracy. It's important to acknowledge that accuracy is really difficult to assess. There are a lot of percentages floating around on false positives, false negatives, and they are really often uh, not correctly interpreted. The percentages always need to be put into relation of the actual numbers, like how many people are actually uh, um, crossing the street, how many people are subjected to the technology, and also how many people are expected to be uh, the wanted in a certain area. And this way, the false positives and false negatives uh, need to be balanced against each other for the uh, uh, purpose of the use of the technology. Also, when you want to try to justify the necessity of the use, while well, there's a lot of important focus on false positives, also the false negatives are relevant. Like if there's a 60% likelihood of finding someone, we need to understand what does this tell us for a specific use case. And then also um, why there's, it's needed to have a discussion on the accuracy rates, accuracy is not everything. And as we heard before, if the technology were perfect, there are still several fundamental rights uh, issues that need to be addressed. So which fundamental rights are impacted on? We heard a few before. Um, respect for private life and protection of personal data are two important rights um, and are at the core of the discussion. And this is, of course, why we have several uh, panels featured at CPDP on this uh, topic. So I won't go into detail because we had already a, a lot of comments on, on from data protection point of view. So I'll also highlight a few others. Um, Hannah already mentioned non-discrimination is an important issue when using the software. We know already that the software does not treat different demographic groups the same way. The error rates are different according to gender, according to age, um, for ethnic groups, and so forth. Um, there were recent uh, reports which were published after our report. It was mentioned before the report from the National Institute of Standardization and Technology in the United States, um, which shows these differences. What I found striking also in this analysis is that there's quite a variation across the different software solutions. So while one software might work well on age, for example, another might not work well on age. So this is an important difference also to keep in mind. Other fundamental rights, um, while we hear a lot about age and ethnicity, the rights of the child and the rights of older persons are also separate rights in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The technology does not work as well for children, and also children uh, need to be protected, uh, especially when the technology is used. Older persons, there's not much research uh, how well it works uh, at a certain age level. And uh, so there are a lot of unknowns on how the, these people are treated when being used. And then also aging is important, like the time between an image was taken and when then the person is tested against, um, where, which really impacts on the accuracy as well. Not mentioned on the slide, uh, the right of persons with disabilities. There's almost no discussion of it, the way it works with people um, with disabilities. Um, Freedom of assembly and association, freedom of expression was mentioned again. This depends much on the use, where it's used. Um, 
Of course, it's difficult to imagine that it's uh, proportionate to use the technology uh, at demonstrations, as it might have a chilling effect and people might restrain from exercising the right of freedom of expression. And then a uh, very EU law specific um, right I would like to highlight is the right to good administration. Um, this is deeply enshrined in the principles of EU law, and it's, there are many issues that are similar to data protection law, but it's also important to highlight this one, the right for fair decisions, the right to access one's files, and so forth. And uh, as another procedural right, the right to effective remedy and fair trial is of course also important with a prerequisite that people know that they are being subjected to the technology because only then they could uh, complain about the use. Um, so to conclude, obviously it comes from data protection requirements that a clear and sufficiently detailed legal framework is needed when the technology is used. However, the fundamental rights risk depend on the application and context of the technology. As I mentioned, for example, the place of use. Um, we advocate that uh, fundamental rights impact assessment is an essential tool that can be used. Since the use of the technology already requires a data protection impact assessment, this assessment can be widened in a way and not just look into data protection, but also look into other areas of rights, like, for example, non-discrimination, freedom of expression, and so forth. Um, public authorities procuring the facial recognition technology should also place fundamental rights requirements at the center of the technical specifications. We often hear copyright issues uh, linked to the transparency of how the technology was built. If this is part of the procurement, then public authorities can also force companies to share this information as it's required for a proper assessment. And then the, to state the obvious close monitoring by independent supervisory bodies um, is needed. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to start by thanking all our speakers for their impeccable timekeeping, which I've been watching on the screen. Um, okay, so I'm the moderator for the remainder of the session. Um, I think what we've seen is that face recognition in the UK is contentious. It's contemporary. There are live trials going on at the moment. There are a number of initiatives where this technology is being used. There is uh, a number of uh, court cases that have been through the system that are in action in terms of appeals and things like that. So it's a very live issue in the UK. So we try to give you a flavor of what's happening. Um, we also see that there's a bit of a regulatory quagmire around the use of AFR in the UK. So we see different agencies grappling with the legal requirements around this, this sort of technology. And there does feel a sense of um, that there's going to be a point coming on the horizon where the UK is going to have to make some decisions about whether or not this technology should be specifically legislated for or regulated against, whether self-voluntary regulation will do, whether or not the technology should be banned or put into a monitorium, um, or whether or not it should be promoted with the, with the interest of the technical industry behind, behind it. So we're going to move to the Q&A session now. Uh, we still have a number of minutes left for questions and answers. Can we follow the usual pattern where just, it, just go up to the speakers if you have a question, up to the microphones rather. Um, please introduce yourself, please any institutional affiliations, and we'll, we'll share the questions out amongst our set of panelists. Hello. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. That was a very interesting um, panel. And uh, I'm Charles Robb from the University of Edinburgh and the Alan Turing Institute. Um, I have a question really for Eduardo, um, but it uh, might also um, implicate uh, Steve perhaps a little bit. Um, I'm very glad that um, David pointed out the need for a human rights um, impact assessment, <clears throat> which might go beyond what we take now to be data protection impact assessments. And so my question really is to Eduardo, who emphasized, I think, quite nicely, the uh, importance of data protection impact assessment, looking at that as a safeguard uh, over things. And I just wondered whether, because a data protection impact assessment is limited in the scope of the range of impacts that it looks at, particularly regarding the individual right to privacy rather than particularly looking at the other sorts of rights that David pointed out, whether you think that a DPIA is an adequate instrument for 
safeguarding um, the use of facial recognition. And for um, uh, Steve, I wonder whether the ICO is thinking of expanding its idea and its templates for DPIA into something which approaches a human rights or an ethical impact assessment. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, aside from the fact that carrying out a data protection impact assessment is a legal obligation, as I see it as a useful tool to take the first step towards first establishing the lawfulness of, in this context, this, this particular technology, but also to identify the measures that must be adopted under the law to ensure that the ty this type of processing is lawful. I think, and I've said this before, you know, Article 35 of the, of the GDPR is probably, together with the provisions around data protection officers, but the, the, the concept of a data protection impact assessment becoming um, a legal obligation is probably the single most important contribution of the entire e new EU legal framework to, to ensure that data is, is, is protected and privacy is protected. So I think, uh, it may not be the only thing, it may not be the, the only um, measure that one needs to, to take, but it's certainly the first one and a, a crucial and very useful measure or tool to, to use. Is it enough? It's not, it's not enough. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, um, is it enough to go to the doctor to cure uh, an illness? You know, it, like it's, it's the first. It's the first step. Um, thank you for your question. Very interesting, actually. Um, we have to be aware of the remit of the um, supervisory authorities, and I am quite conscious that it is a crowded space um, of regulation. Um, but in terms of our DPIAs, I mean, uh, the Information Commissioner has the uh, remit of data protection. But we do want to see a complete package. We do want to see the full story. So if we do get a, a DPIA into our office uh, through prior consultation mechanisms, it's very useful for us to see um, considerations for human rights, ethics, and things like that as part of the explanation as for the processing. Whether or not we would exercise our powers based on that information is another question. And we have to, again, we have to be wary of the remit of the ICO in that area. But something I can certainly feed back, and we can look at things like that in future templates, perhaps. Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm Garland Green, Director of Technology for the International School of Brussels. And I want to make sure that I didn't misunderstand you because it's a little later in the day. Um, it's not your contention that um, we can manage um, AI and facial recognition strictly through the, the GDPR in those regulations, because if, if, that's my, if that's the understanding, I'm not convinced that, um, that I think it's a bit Pollyanna to suggest that that's the case. When, when a data subject or any one of us get uh, you know, a, a law that, that, that's in place that protects all of us, to rely on the ICO to make a judgment on AI and about my facial recognition puts an awful lot of trust in your ability to perform, to perform um, those functions that are best suited have traditionally been suited by legislation. So have I misread you in that sense that you believe that the GDPR is, uh, has enough teeth to, to, to do this over uh, legislation? I think when it thank comes you. to new and novel technologies, and thank you for your question, by the way, it's a very good one. In terms of new and novel technologies, um, and if you've read uh, Elizabeth Denham's opinion, on the use of facial recognition for law enforcement, it clearly goes into the case that, well, the current regime is not, it's okay, but it's not quite enough. We need more than this. And I think it's perhaps incorrect to say that the GDPR is the sticking plaster, the cure-all to all of information rights problems. It's not. There has to be further work here. What we're certainly looking for is collaboration especially in the UK with other supervisory authorities, for example, for Surveillance Camera Commissioner. 
the Biometrics Commissioner, perhaps the Investigatory Powers Commissioner. We need a combination of laws, frameworks, codes of practice to ensure that this technology, this very intrusive technology, can be used appropriately. And I think we're at the very early stages of this, if I'm honest, in the UK. But I, I, you know, I do take your point that there might be a perception that GDPR is the silver bullet, but there needs to be further work there, for sure. Okay, is it possible we could take the next two questions together? Just I'm just watching the time, that's all, so. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Vicky Jans, I'm part of the Data Justice Lab, and this is the third panel of facial recognition, and I can't help wondering one thing, is that do, is it, do public institutions with the financing, the piloting, and the implementation of biometrics like facial recognition, isn't there a, some type of impunity because on the one hand, the worst thing that can happen is a slap on the wrist or saying like, you have to change this, this and that. Whereas in other cases, you might actually be fined or a company will be broken up. And I feel like this impunity might actually lead to more piloting than, des than is desirable. And I was wondering what your opinion is about this, specifically Liberty, ICO or the Biometrics Commissioner. Okay. We'll take the next question and then we'll come back. Alexander Dix from the European Academy for Freedom of Information and Data Protection. Um, no one has mentioned yet uh, on this excellent panel, otherwise, the report by the New York Times about Clearview, which appeared last week. Um, I remember, um, I suspect everyone knows what Clearview is, it's a software company which apparently has amassed a huge uh, database with uh, pictures, uh, uh, based on, uh, 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 on artificial intelligence. And these, this software is apparently being used by American, different American police forces. It's not being used in Europe so far, as, as far as we know. I just wanted to recall um, Richard Thomas, the former uh, UK information commissioner, once at an international conference in Jerusalem, which I had the privilege to attend, uh, called on the DPAs to actually engage with normal people on the street once this technology will become available. Just imagine what women will say when they have to fear that everyone, anyone around them is able to identify them uh, while walking down the street. Uh, one of the uh, uh, people uh, behind Clearview apparently has already designed a kind of new Google Glass, so you could put on this glass and just uh, identify anyone uh, around you. And my question on you is, uh, for you is, do you think this is, this is legal under European law for private companies and for police forces in Europe to use this software? Okay, thank you. We've, so we've got five minutes left. We'll start at this end and work our way along. Great, thank you for your questions. Um, I think this idea of rollout with impunity is a really important question, and that's absolutely what I think we're seeing. We're seeing the use of not just facial recognition, other technologies too, being rolled out by police forces, by private companies, before we've asked the questions that I think we need to be asking, and I've talked through some of those today. Now, obviously, there are some routes of redress. Liberty is investigating each and every one of those, as you might imagine. So we're certainly fighting hard to say that actually that you should be rolled back and we should be, in our view, banning this tool, but certainly having conversations about how human rights compliant it is, in our view, it's not, before we ever even consider even having trials. And I think actually what the trials are looking like is active deployment. If you look at how the police are trialing it, that's the same as everyday operational policing. So I have enormous concerns about the way that this technology is already being used. And interesting, I know it's a hot topic here today and quite rightly, but isn't it strange that we're having having these debates now when it's already in use. I think that that's deeply telling and something that we should be angry about. Sorry, there was another question about Clearview. Um, deeply disturbing, uh, something that we absolutely have our eye on, uh, something we're really conscious of. I think absolutely it's an issue for women, it's an issue for lots of people. I don't think it's exclusive to women, although absolutely recognize there are some particular vulnerabilities there. So watch this space in terms of Liberty's response to that. Really concerned about how things that we see um, at the moment not occurring in the UK, but generally they, they tend to travel just like, for example, ring doorbells travel from the US to the UK. Um, as far as the Information Commissioner is concerned about acting with impunity, I mean, 
we don't care who you are. If you're, you know, if you're processing personal data, it has to adhere to the rules of the law. One of the key threads of GDPR, as you well know, will be accountability. And it's, very, um, it's a hot topic for the ICO to make sure that if you are processing personal data, processing biometric data of identifiable, identifiable individuals, that you're able to explain fully and justify why that is the case, why it's lawful, why it's proportionate, why it's necessary. So I don't think that those that are processing are acting in that way in some ways, but we are certainly on their tail. We are asking the difficult questions. We are going to them and saying, where's your documentation for this? Where's the lawful basis? And we're seeing it trans uh, move into the, the courtroom as well. We're seeing, you know, this is, this is happening. I probably agree with what Hannah said. It might be a little bit further down the line than we wished, but we have to deal with the, the current situation as it stands, as it is. Um, in terms of the Clearview case, very, very interesting case, uh, very worrying case, if that, you know, if what they say is true. Um, surely those who use social media have a reasonable expectation that if they put something on the internet, it won't be used for something else. Um, something our office will no doubt be looking into. Um, not quite sure if it has affected any EU residents as of yet, but certainly it's something that's piquing our interest. Thank you. Can I just say that trying to prohibit or ban something that is already happening is really, really difficult, I think. But given that it's already happening, and also that the legal framework is already there, I think what is more effective is to use that legal framework to regulate what is already happening. Um, yeah, I would like to, to react quickly to the question on whether or not the GDPR is enough. Um, first of all, the GDPR is a great tool which we have at our disposal and has several great provisions that can also apply to the use of artificial intelligence. Um, we also have other good tools like non-discrimination law which apply equally to the use of artificial intelligence. But there is awareness of the challenges and this is also why the European Commission is looking into regulatory options of artificial intelligence. In parallel, also the Council of Europe is looking into the feasibility of international law uh, on the use of artificial intelligence. And these are processes which we should, of course, closely watch and see what comes out. Okay, and finally from me, um, I don't think GDPR is sufficient. I do think primary legislation is required that is more robust, provides greater guidance. Um, I think that uh, there needs to be a very nuanced look at this uh, use of technology because it does provide a threat to human rights. It provides um, threats to the way we live, freedom of expression. All of those are, I think, uh, paramount. However, uh, the state has also got an obligation to protect us. And I believe that that regulation needs to look at the narrow circumstances where this technology may support us rather than dismiss it out of hand. And I think that is the very difficult question that has to be engaged. Um, the terrorism attack on Westminster Bridge, it is eminently foreseeable that a very narrow deployment of this technology in a narrow set of circumstances could have been of fundamental use. And I think the question has to be, have we got the wherewithal to develop a framework of oversight that provides sufficient confidence to the public that it can be deployed to keep us safe? So I, I very much stay on the side of not throwing this technology in the bin. But I do remind you that actually, despite the comments I'm throwing out, which is, yes, I do think it's got a role to play, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only regulator in the UK that's actually stopped the police from using it on five occasions. So I think there is a really nuanced piece of work that needs to be placed. But top, there needs to be new legislation. Okay, that's great. We're out of time. So I'd just like to finish by asking you to thank our speakers in the traditional way. And uh, you can grab them for a chat during the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.